they're very persuasive. I mean, from a mathematical point of view, and even from an experimental point of view, it is hard to resist the fact that there is something about that future wave function that is absolutely affecting the present. Today, I have the honor of talking to Father Robert J. Spitzer, a Jesuit priest and one of the most prominent, prolific, and compelling philosophers of science on the scene today. He is a former president of Gonzaga University and is currently directing several institutes he founded, among them the Magis Center at the Christ Cathedral in Orange County, California, and the Philosophical Foundations of Physics at Georgetown University. Apart from his astounding command of science, Father Spitzer is an expert on management and ethics, topics which are of special interest to me and our work at ASIM. If you listen to our discussion today, it's helpful to contextualize what's taking place. Father Spitzer is not some solitary figure working and theorizing at the outskirts of the scientific and philosophical project. He's actually carrying the torch for a long line of illustrious Catholic scientists and thinkers that go back 2,000 years and include, among hundreds of others, people like Augustine, Aquinas, Copernicus, Gregor Mendel, George Lemaitre, and more recently, Juan Maldacena. Keep in mind that the Catholic Church, irrespective of how you feel about it, objectively speaking, in terms of longevity, is the single most successful organization in the history of the world. This is no small statement. Another factor to keep in mind as you listen to us converse is that this is not a typical conversation. We're going after two of the most challenging questions in the history of philosophy and theology. First is the question of evil, and second, the question of whether or not nature is theologically ambiguous. Robert Kuhn asks this question in his enormously successful television series, Closer to Truth. Another way to phrase his question is to ask if God exists, then which religion, among the countless number of them, is the correct and most true religion? To a theist, this is surely one of the most embarrassing questions of all. To begin to answer that question, in a previous video, I set out the physical foundations of morality. I recommend watching that video to get a feel for just how rigorous and scientifically sound is the argument we have continued to lay out in this discussion. Unfortunately, we don't get as far as I would have liked to get in this first conversation, and I don't manage to communicate the ideas with the clarity I would have liked. But we do get some important initial ideas out there, namely the role of interpretation in physics and the validity of Aharonov's two-state approach to quantum collapse. We could have continued for a long time, but Father Spitzer was only able to give me 45 minutes. I wasn't able to counter his idea that God permits evil so that good might come about. In any case, Father Spitzer has been receptive to continuing the conversation, which by incorporating the latest advances in string theory, I hope to convince you is a novel and important contribution to the history of ideas, especially if we measure the importance of an idea in terms of how much it leads to a better understanding of nature and how much it protects us from destroying ourselves. These are extraordinary claims that smack of delusion, 
But if you listen carefully, you'll see that it's not nearly as delusional as it might seem. In any case, the reason I'm here is to dialogue. So if you disagree with anything, let me know and I'd love to have you on as a guest. As always, you'll find a timestamp in the video description. Thanks for your time. Father Spitzer, I'm really honored to have you on as a guest and would like to begin by thanking you for being so generous with your time today. Great to be with you, Luis, and uh, uh, the good work that you're doing as well, bringing this dialogue together. It's, uh, it's uh, really excellent, and I'm honored to be with you. Oh, it's my pleasure. Father, I've already given a short introduction to your work and how it's situated historically within the rigorous and venerable uh, Jewish tradition of using science and reason to understand our faith. If it's, uh, if it's okay with you, I'd like to take a different approach in, sure. in our short time together. And I wanna do something that um, I think atheists are reluctant to do, which is I want to steel man their argument. In other words, I want to make their argument as strong as possible. And okay. I think the, maybe you'll agree, maybe you won't agree, but I think one, two of the strongest arguments that a non-believer uh, can make against the idea that God exists and God is all powerful mm -hmm. and all good is mm -hmm. the problem of evil on the one hand. Yeah. Yeah. And on the other hand, even if we accept your various uh, physical arguments for the existence of God and mm -hmm. how compelling they are, there's still the problem of, okay, if God exists, then which one of the thousands of different religions is the right one? So I think mm -hmm. these are two, um, objectively speaking, very powerful arguments mm -hmm. against uh, the existence of God. Yeah. And another point that I'd like to make is that maybe, again, maybe you'd agree or disagree with this, but it seems to me that um, belief in God or, or, or unbelief um, ultimately is a matter of an emotional thing and not necessarily a rational thing. Would you agree or disagree with that, Father? Well, I, you know, being a Catholic and all, um, I do believe in the, the nexus of faith and reason. But um, yes, I do think there is definitely a component. Uh, you, you're referring to it as emotional. Uh, we would call it this component, the interior component of faith, um, where there's really an act of the will as part of it, you know, willingness and openness. Uh, to be responsible to a creator, or perhaps uh, an openness to be responsible to a moral agency outside of myself, that act of the will combines up also with an intuition that there is some kind of a providential care uh, out there. Um, there is a providential care in here as well. So there's, uh, you know, sort of an in inner light is what I would call it. Uh, you know, something that's really been diagnosed uh, very profoundly by people like Rudolf Otto uh, in his book, uh, The Idea of the Holy, where he talks about the numinous experience as an interior experience common to all religions and all people. Uh, it's a very uh, a compelling argument, I think. And in the second uh, book, um, there's a, uh, it's called The Sacred and the Profane by Mircea Eliada. It's a, he's the one who actually edited Macmillan's big, huge encyclopedia of religion, uh, tremendous uh, philosopher of religion. And he calls it the, sort of this intuition of the sacred, uh, this sense that the sacred has broken into the world, that we have an intuition of it. And he says, well, why is most of the world uh, religious? You know, so I think the last Pew survey, uh, we, we have a big foundation here, the Pew uh, Foundation that, that looks at these, um, these uh, uh, you know, world trends. And uh, in that landscape survey, I think it was still that 85 or 86 percent of the world is still um, uh, very much religious uh, in one capacity or another. And Mercy Aliad and Otto and people of their ilk would say, oh, uh, and, and I'm of their ilk, uh, would say, yeah, we do have a, a fundamental interior experience that's common to all religions. Um, and, you know, that's motivating us. But along with it, say the Catholics, you can also have a reasonable dimension. I mean, after all, the person who really first uh, set out the equations uh, for the Big Bang Theory was a priest. I mean, it was Father Georges Lemaitre, Monsignor Lemaitre. Uh, yes, uh, there were other people that were involved in it, you know, the Friedman and Slifer and uh, all kinds of people that were involved in it, but definitely 
um, uh, Monsignor Lemaitre was the first to publish it. And he was actually recognized by Einstein for uh, coming up with the equations. Of course, at the time in 1927, uh, Einstein was not a friend of the expanding universe, but eventually he was persuaded because of the uh, survey of the heavens done by um, Edwin Hubble here in the, in the States in 1929, was persuaded that the Lemaitre equations were correct. I mean, the constant that Lemaitre had in the equations had to be corrected and was corrected subsequently by Hubble, but now it's been corrected again, uh, actually several different times, uh, because of course, uh, better astronomical equipment, uh, better ability to, to really detect what the true recessional velocity um, uh, you know, increase is uh, per distance from the observer. So um, you know, the, uh, the, the idea there, though it was a, a Catholic priest. So you know, there's, there is that dimension of faith and reason uh, that has always been more or less combined in, in, in my um, uh, area and my uh, uh, Catholic faith. So that's, uh, that's not uncommon, but absolutely there is an emotional dimension, no question about it. Um, uh, you, uh, but it, I, I would say rather than emotional dimension, I would call it um, both a choice, a willingness uh, to, uh, to acknowledge that they're a mere creature before this uh, creator who's uh, vastly more intelligent and good than I am. And um, uh, that willingness is really important. That's the choice part. God does want us to be free and lets us be free. Um, that's why no possible proof can be absolutely persuasive as Dostoevsky put it, right? God's not going to enslave us to a miracle. Um, he's not gonna make a miracle so persuasive that we have no choice but to believe. There has to be that willingness to accept the creator. And also there has to be that acknowledgement of that interior intuition of the sacred as uh, Eliade would call it, or the numinous experience as, as Otto would call it. That's universal in, in, in every religion across the world. I see. Well, the reason I bring that up is because so many bright people, um, bright scientists, some of the world's most prominent scientists, will take a look at the evidence uh, of the sciences mm -hmm. and come to opposite conclusions about uh, the existence mm -hmm. of God. So I think this brings yeah. us to, to one of the main ideas that I wanted to get across to you and discuss is the concept of interpretation. Right, because physics and nature and science can be interpreted in any number of different ways. And mm -hmm. here, I think it's worth mentioning, as I often do the, in physics, the, um, the idea of, uh, of Richard Feynman yeah. who in his Feynman lectures clarified um, to the amusement of the audience who was not mm -hmm. expecting it that the, interpretation of physics is actually something that is um, allowable and good, and that any good physicist keeps uh, as many possible interpretations in his mind as possible, because he never knows, he or she never knows, which one of those interpretations is going to be the, uh, was going to lead to the next big breakthrough. So can you comment on this? I, I know you have your own ideas about interpretation based on the work of uh, Lonergan. Uh, yeah. Can you comment about this? How, how interpret, what role does interpretation play in physics? Well, it plays a, a huge in, you know, role. I think we can see just in the um, uh, quantum reduction problem, how important it is. Uh, for example, you can see the Copenhagen interpretation, which is basically don't interpret it, just you utilize the equations which function properly. So you could have that kind of a, a viewpoint, which is definitely non-Richard Feynman uh, uh, interpret, uh, way of looking at things, right? He, he would be open to a variety more of interpretations. And then of course you have the many worlds interpretation. Uh, I myself um, uh, don't hold to it because I don't think you can get a complete explanation. There's a, a disjointing uh, and a disconnection of half of the sibling observers in all the many worlds that are coming about. And, um, so, uh, but nevertheless, that's my opinion of the many worlds, but that is an interpretation. Uh, of might, might, I, might I interrupt very quickly, Father? I absolutely yep. agree with you. I think something, in my opinion, more compelling than this uh, is the idea that the many worlds has nothing relevant to say about this world. The yeah. one in which we actually live. 
Uh, we can't prove whether or not other worlds exist. Maybe they do. But whether mm -hmm. or not they do, it says nothing about this world, the one in which we actually live. And I think this is where possibly religion and science can converge to the extent that we care about things that happen in this world, not in yeah. other, other worlds. That's right. And I, I think, um, uh, you know, for science is definitely, since it's grounded in observational evidence, it's definitely interested in what's going on in this world, because that's where the evidence is coming from, essentially. And so you have to know uh, what are the effects in this world and, and so forth. And also, like I said, the whole idea of having sibling observers in each passing moment where there's a decision to be made, uh, half of your siblings will be disjointed from the previous moment. Uh, these kinds of things I, I don't think are really acceptable um, in a comprehensive uh, explanation. I think that leaves you just with subjective reduction. That's possible. You have objective reduction. That's another interpretation. Then you have orchestrated objective reduction. And uh, you have great physicists like John von Neumann uh, that would be you know, a subjective reduction advocate. In fact, Niels Bohr, I think, in, in, at the end of the day was a subjective reduction uh, advocate. And, and uh, many others um, definitely thought that human consciousness, Henry Stapp, uh, uh, continues to give some interesting, um, you know, uh, thoughts about this. Thinks that uh, that human consciousness and its decision-making uh, capacity can actually affect um, the collapse of the wave function. Uh, then, of course, you have Roger Penrose um, and many others who are staunch advocates of uh, of objective reduction, and he thinks really that there are there's a really a threshold in gravitation. Um, which is right now, we, we, we just don't notice the perturbation, gravitational perturbations on this level, but he really believes that there's almost a ubiquitous kind of uh, uh, objective reduction going on because of gravity uh, all over the place. Um, you know, and that could, of course, occur independently of, of uh, human consciousness. And then you have, of course, a, a synthetic uh, approach, uh, orchestrated objective reduction, et cetera. So this, this kind of multiple approach to, you know, um, uh, the uh, the collapse of the wave function, or in the case of many worlds, no collapse of the wave function, just continuous propagation of uh, universes. Whatever the case may be, these are all interpretations. And I, I agree with Fine. The more we can keep these different interpretations in our mind, uh, the better off we are for two reasons. Uh, first, of course, creativity, uh, you know, the mu multiplicity of perspectives creates creativity. It's the old uh, eureka effect, right? Um, and and uh, once you have, you know, th this idea of many, many perspectives coming in there, your imagination, your subconscious is constantly working uh, by looking at these various things. And then, you know, they, they, they provide an analogical backdrop. You almost get that, um, uh, that sense that there are analogies, things, similarities that I can grasp onto. And, and uh, that helps in the creative process in isolating perhaps one interpretation that will make a difference at least in a particular problem area that's relevant to the world right now. Um, and, and so that uh, in a sense is, is really important um, just, just for the sake of uh, you know, creative imagination uh, to come up with a problem uh, in the same way Archimedes did, right? That idea of you know, going into the into the you know baths of Syracuse, watching the the water rise, and being able to to see the law of displacement in the uniform rising of the water in the bathtub, uh, that came because his his creative imagination was trained on a multiplicity of perspectives that were kind of flying around in that imagination of his. The the second uh, reason I think it's it's really important is because eventually we kind of move into what I would call dialectic. We get, uh, you know, when, when, we're, when we have a multiplicity of perspectives that we're looking at, eventually we have to compare and contrast. And that's what a scientist does. That's what a philosopher does. Those are the things that are there in common. And, and uh, that this comparison, this contrast, this looking for the one that is the most complete explanation, the least contradictory explanation, the one that does, you know, that obeys uh, the law of parsimony, right? The, the Occam's razor, as it were. It's not just injecting whole, you know, dimensions of uh, of uh, you know useless 
uh, laws and axioms that uh, uh, maybe not useless, but let's say they're extra and extra and extra, um, you know, as uh, um, Paul Davies once said about the many worlds interpretation from quantum theory, uh, he said, uh, well, that's like bringing excess baggage to cosmic extremes. Uh, in other words, uh, so I think what every scientist just has inside of him or her is this ability uh, to, to look for the most complete explanation, look for the most internally consistent, mathematically coherent explanation. And finally, that there is that law of parsimony, that Occam's razor that's kind of built into that imagination. So as you're going about looking at these various perspectives, right? Uh, you're constantly comparing and contrasting with these three canons of empirical method in mind. And as you do that, uh, eventually you come up with something that's pretty good. And I think that's what Feynman did. You know, some of, of uh, you know, the, uh, you know, of, uh, of interpretations, uh, this, you know, if you, if you look at his, uh, his way of resolving, um, you know, quantum problems and uh, probabilistic uh, analysis for ideal frequencies, you can see this is something that just kind of was in his mind. I mean, it was in the whole way he operated. And so it comes as no surprise to me that he's got a multiplicity of perspectives, but he's conscious of them all at the same time. Of course, geniuses can be uh, very conscious of all these perspectives at the same time because they're geniuses and they can kind of hold all these things in their mind. But as they do, they come up with the most creative solutions. Uh, they come up uh, with these eureka moments that are uh, truly in genes. Well, you make so many great points, Father, so many great points. There is one uh, interpretation that you did not mention, and mm -hmm. talking about geniuses, I think it's a genius interpretation. Um, yeah. Judging by the various parameters uh, that you've, that you've uh, established in terms of mathematical rigor, in terms of em empirical uh, proof, is um, Yakir Aharnov's two-state vector formalism. Yeah. So the way he resolves the measurement problem um, is by positing two wave functions, one that comes from the past to the present, and another comes from the future to the present. And once mm -hmm. again, I think it, it mathematically, it's on par with all of the other uh, mainstream interpretations. Yeah. Yes. Per perhaps, perhaps I'm... I'm biased here, I would say it's even a little more mathematically rigorous if that's possible. But I think in terms of empirical fruits, as far as I uh, know, it's, it's unparalleled. And it's very interesting because it, it squares intuitively with our experience of reality. Unlike the many worlds interpretation, it squares yeah. with our intuitive experience of reality where we are goal-oriented uh, conscious beings. Right, and where our goals yep. finally have an impact on how physical systems evolve, in, in particular our, our bodies. Right, if I if I make a goal of going south, it's very different. Physics evolves in a way in yes. uh, in a very different way than if I make a goal to to move north. Right, so yeah, absolutely, um, and uh, I agree with you. I think uh, Aharonov's. Um, um, weak experiments, you know, that, uh, that uh, um, they're very persuasive. I mean, from a mathematical point of view, and even from an experimental point of view, it is hard to resist the fact that there is something about that future wave function that is absolutely affecting the present. Now, of course, you know, that's a head scratcher because time is a non-contemporaneous continuum. And so you're thinking to yourself for a second, wait a minute, you know, uh, if time's a non-contemporaneous, uh, you know, uh, a continuum and, and the future hasn't quite yet happened or has it happened in some other transcendent way? In sure, some way. Another frame of reference, that, right? Yeah, exactly. Beyond the, uh, beyond, let's say, let's suppose you could get out of the non-contemporaneous continuum but uh, very much you could affect, um, uh, you know, or have some, uh, you know, not only knowledge, but some efficacious effect in that future, um, you know, and then uh, bring the two points together in some sort of, um, um, maybe it's a mentative state, 
so uh, you know the how is is going to be really important here. You know how, how are we going to explain this? Uh, that's a very important um, uh, thing. But first of all, Aharonov, he he does have something utterly persuasive. He has something here that may explain, um, in fact, rigorously explain from an empirical point of view as well as mathematical one, theoretical one. He has uh, uh, something here that that could really change the whole way we look at. Um, at um, uh, the, not only the reduction, uh, but how we look at time itself, how we look at the future, and even how we look at transcendence. Um, you know, maybe I'll go back to Berg Somme for one moment again. Um, uh, he wrote a book called Duration and Simultaneity, uh, sort of his way of trying to bring Einstein and himself together in his philosophy of science. But in previous works, uh, Berg Somme was trying to explain how, how can it be <clears throat> you know, that uh, the present moment, it, it has to have duration. You can't say that the present lasted for zero seconds. It has to be some non-zero magnitude. So he's trying to think through this thing, but a non-zero magnitude must mean that there's earlier and later in the present. So he's, he's, he's saying, okay, I can't reduce the, the present moment to zero because then I reduce the whole of history to zero uh, temporal magnitude. Uh, that means that everything happened in zero seconds and of course that's absurd. So he says, okay, I gotta have a present moment duration. Sorry to get into this complication, but uh, I think the relevance of it will be um, clear in a moment. And so what he says is, okay, how can I get non-contemporaneity? How can I get earlier and later uh, into the present? Uh, and he says, the only way I can really do this is by some sort of mentative act. In mentation, that is to say in thinking, I, I can basically at least keep, as it were, the past in my mind or the earlier in my mind as uh, the later is emerging. I can keep, uh, you know, the, the previous moment in, in my mind, I'm, I'm using my own, uh, this is an analogy here, uh, while the, the, uh, the, the, the next moment, as it were, is emerging, and I can keep the two of them together and continuously keep them together so Bergson resolves on what's called a proto-mentalist philosophy. He, he, he actually, uh, here he's going beyond science, right? He's going to, he's saying, I can only explain time if I can get to some kind of transcendence that is holding together the non-contemporaneity of the continuum. But what Bergson says in the same moment is he says, look, if, I, if, if there's a transcendence which is holding together the non-contemporaneity in the present, and indeed throughout the whole of history, then that transcendent mind must have um, some kind of a, you know, an, an effect a, uh, on the whole, you know, at, at the, you know as, as a now, as it were. So he comes to a, a, a view of this kind of eternal now that goes all the way back, by the way, to St. Augustine. Of, sure. of a transcendent being that really does, as it were, make the non-contemporaneity, but in itself lives outside, as if I can say that, um, that, that non-contemporaneity. Now, here's where Yakir uh, uh, Aharonov comes in, because uh, Aharonov uh, um, basically is showing empirically a, a sort of Bergsonian condition. I can't, this is sure. really fascinating. Sure, sure, sure. Well, Very fascinating. I yeah. would say, I would add, Father, to that, if, if I might, yeah. the, the growing consensus in mainstream physics that space and time emerges from something more fundamental. Mm -hmm. So if space and time emerges from, time itself emerges from something more fundamental, then it seems logical to, uh, to suggest that the future and the past from the frame of reference of that more fundamental time that the future and the past have an impact on, on the present. And then I think this is, uh, forgive me if I, if I change the subject a little because our goal was to talk about the problem of evil. Sure. Oh seems, yeah. It seems to me that if in fact the future does have an impact on the present, then we, and we think about the progress of science where, for example, now we are beginning to understand uh, more and more the human genome and through technology like CRISPR, we're beginning to alter the uh, genetic makeup of humans and animals, et cetera. 
if we simply extrapolate this, this continuing progress in technology and in science, we can imagine that at some point in the future, it, there, we, we reach a perfection, right? And this is the perfection that is described in religion as, or in the Bible. From that perfection, because we started to uh, do things that were prohibited, such as altering the human genome, we kind of fall back into what we experience now as evil. I don't know how clear that explanation was, but it seems to me like something worth exploring. Does that make sense to you, Father? Yeah. Well, um, you know, from uh, certainly from an ethical point of view, um, this is an interesting question. Uh, there was a, um, a Jesuit um, philosopher of science by the name of Teilhard de Chardin, and he certainly, um, uh, a French uh, philosopher of science, he certainly, he had a view of what he called the omega point. Uh, he basically thought, um, you know, that this, uh, that human beings were not just tending on their own, in their own autonomy uh, toward um, a, a perfection um, or a perfectibility uh, that, that's gradually being realized. But he also thought that they were being guided uh, in that perfectibility um, uh, by this omega point, uh, you know, like a final cause in the Aristotelian sense that's uh, standing at the end. Of course, he identifies the omega point with Christ or with God, but it, you know, you could with the divine, you could just say in a more a generic uh, religious sense. So he he sees uh, God sort of drawing all things uh, to um, uh, its its uh, fruition um, there, and and that's generally called orthogenesis. You know, where the future is is more or less uh, affecting what's going on in the present as opposed to nomogenesis, right, where the um, God is like front-loading all of the, the, um, the conditions into, uh, into rea reality at the Big Bang or something. Now, the, the, the key thing, though, with the, the orthogenesis um, uh, people, like Teilhard, is that um, there's, so there's two wills involved, if I might put it that way, um, in this idea of, let's say, CRISPR. Uh, for example, I have a, a severe eye condition called retinitis pigmentosa. Uh, perhaps I can get a CRISPR injection within a year that will alter uh, the genome um, in uh, the next layer of retinal cells, which wow. will be my vision back. So you could say, well, that kind of use of CRISPR, well, that's a good use of CRISPR because what it takes is it does gene alterations not to perfect the human race beyond what it was meant to be, but just to alleviate, let's say, uh, some diseases. Okay, so that's, that's one thing. Uh, but then the second thing that's, that's uh, you know, interesting is you're right. We could start saying, well, I, I, I'd really like to have kids who are going to be genetically superior, you know, to other kids. And um, you could say even um, I would pay uh, the best uh, geneticist to get, you know, various kinds of, um, you know, uh, uh, even intrauterine uh, uh, genetic uh, therapies of various kinds to uh, to um, have to, smarter kids than other kids. I'd like to create a super race, frankly, in sure. the laboratory. Once you get into that domain, you know, Teilhard would just say, "Well, that's where the human will uh, moves outside of uh, you know the perfection that you know the omega point is drawing us towards." Fantastic. In other words, fantastic. I agree with that, Father. Father. This is interesting, especially interesting in light of the Our Father, no? Because yeah. your will be done, not mine, right? Exactly. So from, that, from that omega point, that omega point is human perfection and everything mm -hmm. that that entails, happiness, eternal life, mm -hmm. etc. cetera. And it's a, something that's controlled other than myself. But if I uh, violate the rules of that omega point, right? Mm -hmm. Then I, in some sense, fall back into this, into this world that we've created, no? Have, have mm -hmm. we, in this sense, responded to the question of evil, do you think, Father? Well, I think, you know, the, the question of evil can be daunting, um, you know, if you, um, if, you, if you have no sense that there is, uh, like if you're trying to show that God doesn't exist by using the problem of evil, then you actually, 
take the only road of a solution out of the picture. In other words, it, it almost becomes a self-refuting argument. You're trying to prove that the very being which could lead to perfectibility doesn't exist by the present condition of evil. And here's where I would bring Aharonov's and, and your thesis right back into the, um, into the picture. Because at, at this juncture, right, if you really do have um, a, a god, let's say, uh, a transcendent uh, being uh, who truly is good, and he's in the picture, he can constantly be using not just human evil to bring the next level of perfectibility. So for example, after World War II, right, you have this horrible travesty that has been done. Yet out of this springs international courts of law, springs the United Nations, springs a whole series of mechanisms for economic justice that weren't even thought of before, uh, you know, certainly not during the, the, the time of the Industrial Revol Revolution, which led to so many of the abuses that Nazi Germany and other people were reacting to, et cetera. But you start looking at that and you go, gosh, you know, it's not just that we, wow, we survived that mess, but we learned something we did create institutions to better the world and better justice. Now, sometimes, of course, we, we had scars from that that were still with us today. But, but at the same time, I do see, you know, um, if, if we're talking about getting a remedy to the problem of evil, we, we just can't be doing um, uh, this kind of an analysis, uh, you know, in, in the problem of evil to, you know, if you're doing it just to eliminate God, then you're going to wind up eliminating the solution of the problem. I don't think God created us in a perfect world intentionally. I think he wanted us to respond to challenge. I think he wanted us to get together as human beings to seek for something better through our collective efforts. I think he wanted us to search for a better way than a class-filled society that, that is con constituted by a majority of slaves. I think there. <clears throat> There's a sort of a, 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 you know, he's giving us an impetus uh, to, to make these moves by our reaction uh, to a, an imperfect world. But at the same time, there's ego everywhere in this world, right? And when, it, when I decide that my ego is a lot more important than the welfare of everybody around me, uh, that <laughs> I give birth to evil, let's face facts, on a personal level. And so I'm, I'm the source of, of, of that evil. And, and so in a way, you know, there's, there's evil coming from human beings, there's evil coming from social structures, there's evil uh, that's in the, we, we live in an imperfect world to begin with, with earthquakes and genetic difficulties. But in all of these things that are happening, um, there's something not only in the human spirit, I would uh, advocate. I think there is something uh, in the omega point, something in the transcendence that is trying to guide us toward perfectibility that says, you know, after this war, don't just kill the people that, you know, were your enemies. <clears throat> Try to restore them back to a level of civility. <clears throat> don't just respond with a sense of, um, of, uh, of real, um, uh, you know, uh, um, what I would call vengeance and, and uh, retribution, but respond instead with a sense of mercy and a sense of making a better world and a sense of learning the lessons of the past and never repeating them. In, in a way, there's, yes, it's partly the human spirit, it's partly the collective human spirit, but there's something coursing in that spirit I would maintain that we can see in the future wave function of a harana, that we can see a kind of, as you put it, um, you know, that there's an anticipation that there's something um, already sort of guiding this to a, a better conclusion that's not forcing us to do it, that's not forcing us to open ourselves to the insight, but is constantly sort of proposing it to us, uh, guiding us toward it. And, and that, I, I think, you know, in, in that sense, I, I do think there's a solution to the problem of evil. Because I think <clears throat> God knew the minute he created one free agent, there could be autonomous evil right there through that human agent. 
you know, who puts his ego above the welfare of everybody else. So I think he, he realized that and in realizing that at the same time, he also uh, brings about a, um, a, a, a real possibility of, a, of us making a better world, of us transcending, uh, you know, the, the mistakes of the past and, and so forth. Father, I want to be respectful of your time. Unfortunately, we did not get to um, which religion is right, and we could have gone on in forever. But like I said, I want to be respectful, and, and you've been so generous. Um, I hope uh, if, if the opportunity presents itself, I'd love to have you on again at some point in the future. Sure. Absolutely. Not, fantastic. Well, thank you. Can you please um, uh, give a quick uh, summary of what you're doing now and, and where people can find you, what you're up to? Uh, yeah, um, of course, uh, Majacenter.com, as you already uh, pointed out, we have uh, a variety of different resources in the whole area of faith and science. And uh, as a matter of fact, we have a, a lot of resources, too, in the whole area of human suffering um, and, uh, and evil. So um, uh, I would probably just uh, start with uh, um, Majacenter.com and uh, take a look at that. Um, uh, just uh, you know, there's a book that uh, just came out called Theism and Atheism, Opposing Arguments in Philosophy. Um, uh, you know, the, I have a, a big article there with a physicist named James Sinclair, uh, just uh, taking a look at the, the fine tuning argument from a more technical, uh, physical point of view for those who are, uh, enjoy the more uh, physics oriented approach. Uh, you could go to that, it's, it's called um, uh, Fine Tuning and um, Indications of Transcendent Intelligence. Uh, so, um, uh, and a variety of other kinds of things like that. So uh, anyway, uh, uh, you can get, that's a Macmillan reference volume. Uh, you could get that or uh, uh, take a look at a summary I have of it on the website. Fantastic, Father. Well, once again, thank you so much for your time and I hope you enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you so much, Luis.